This video was originally recorded March 2020 at Menla Retreat at Dewa Spa in Phoenicia, New York. Hope you are staying safe, healthy, and happy during the quarantine. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in. Is that good? Yeah. You think so? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a talking head and a stationary head. <laughs> And namely the Manjushri Bodhisattva behind me, which is very auspicious. I am uh, broadcasting now from Menla Mountain Retreat and Spa. And I am teaching this class this way because Tibet House has closed to any large gatherings of people like a class. And um, so we just re it's being recorded, and you will get to see it in the t in the appropriate time. I understand that the uh, first two lectures that we did on the two previous Wednesdays, uh, uh, March fourth and eleventh, I think, that they have been recorded and they are being replayed for you to remember where we were. And I also forget where we were in between. And, um, but, um, and so what I'm using is I'm using Tutan Jimba's wonderful book, Tsongkhapa, a Buddha in the Land of Snows, published by Shambhala Publications. Uh, I am reading for, uh, you know, I'm just opening it at random, I'm using it as a, as a, um, Ouija board. I just open it at random, and I come to the perfect place to start, and I think it fits with what we discussed the other day. So, um, and I hope, by the way, all of you are warm and happy and using this catastrophe that has struck our country and our economy and um, as a, um, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. And even those very tragic cases where people do pass away, we want them to be stronger in their following lives. So we want to even apply it to them. So that which does not uh, destroy their virtue and their orientation toward higher forms of evolutionary life, better human forms and other kinds of forms, may even being killed not disturb their progress. That's our prayer. And But do please take it seriously. And, uh, and it helps us have more altruism with others because of course we can easily give them the infection if we're infected just as they can give it to us. And so even though it's isolation, it, it binds us more together. So we should be able to think in that way as well, I hope. So, okay, so now on we go. And uh, I'm on page 158, if any of you by now have bought this book. And it's talking about more consul consultations with Manjushri on the view. And uh, this is where he personally is talking to Tsongkhapa. And Tsongkhapa no longer has Umapa as a medium. And Tonkin Jambagatsu is with Tsongkhapa at this time. He's one of the eight companions who are with him at all times. But uh, there's no record that he is transmitting this from Manjushri, but rather that Manjushri is talking directly. It was so interesting, too, to hear what we read last time um, in Tsongkhapa saying that when you see a Yidda, you see it with your mental consciousness and not with your visual consciousness. But your mental consciousness itself reproduces a visual experience, which in fact it does by aligning itself with our eye and so on, and ear. In other words, the mental consciousness is in the heart, but it uses our sense organs of our coarse body, ordinary body anyway. And but without them, you know, like sometimes you can be looking at something and not really notice it because you're intently listening on something or intently thinking about something else, which means that your mental consciousness is going somewhere else. So it's not aligning itself with the visual one. So similarly, in the Buddhist psychology, the mental consciousness can go direct to the external world through sort of subtle senses, let's say. And it's those subtle senses with which you, when you meditate yourself as a, as a deity in the tantric practice, you, you imagine from there that you are that, rather than sort of thinking my cross body is some other weird thing. And when you see it, when you have a vision of a, of a kind of angelic or 
archangel, like Manjushri, the archangel of wisdom, when you see that, you're seeing a field, like, from your mind. And when, when we read that at that time, it reminded me of a wonderful thing, I, I know this is digressing, but this might interest you, a wonderful book by a French, a late French person, uh, called Jacques Lusserand, L-U-S-S-E-Y-R-A-N, I think, uh, called And There Was Light. And this was a man who became blind at around eight or ten, nine or ten, in a, in a classroom accident, actually fell and smashed his head and became blind. Uh, but then he developed a sixth sense, which is like the mental sense, and after some time he could more or less see volumes and feel volumes of things, and he knew they were there, almost saw them. And that's what he meant by, and there was light. Because they sort of, he got light in a different way. Without this is the medium, because the eye optic nerve was not working, so it wasn't through the eye. And it's a marvelous story about him and all his adventures. And he was in the resistance against the German occupation of France and so forth. Then he became a great professor, even though blind. You know, he was a really marvelous person and an interesting book. And what he was doing, I think, he was reconstructing uh, a thought from a point of view of without having any language about it or yoga about it, he was seeing out of his subtle body as if you're having a dream while you're awake. And the dream body has its senses, has eyes and ears and nose and tongue and, and skin, you know, uh, uh, touch, you know. So it has all of those things in a subtle plane. And in a way, without thinking that's what he was doing, that is what he was doing, is what made me think. Anyway, never mind, I know that's a digression. Well, now, he's talking to uh, Manjushri, and this happened in 1397, Fire Ox Year. And Zongaba was at a place called Senge Zong, the Lion Fort, where he was doing Kalachakra studies, actually, very interesting, and Kalachakra practices. And um, he, um, but he's still pushing on emptiness, and what is the right thing about emptiness? Or, you know, my favorite word now, freedom, which I like to call it, it is freedom. He's still pushing on that, even though he's doing Kala Chakra practice. So he asks more questions of Manjushri, and then Manjushri rebukes him a little bit by saying that now there is no more need to ask me questions frequently. If you explore with refined analysis the treatises composed by the great charioteers, uh, pioneers, I would prefer to call them, that set forth the meaning of those three baskets, that's all the Buddhist literature, all the Buddha's teachings, as well as the four classes of Tantra. You will find they are generally in accord with what I have revealed to you. Should there ever be any discrepancy, it is the oral instructions that must be abandoned, not the great treatises. Isn't that interesting? Manjushri himself, the god of wisdom, really would be super normal, um, super planetary, um, being of pure wisdom, knowledge of reality, that is, of pure science, therefore, is saying, I'm telling you this orally, but if what I say doesn't agree with the great treatises of the thousands of, by that time, two thousand years of Buddhist learning and Buddhist study and Buddhist science, then reject what I'm saying. He's saying that to him. Oh, I like that. We'll come back to that later about how Buddha, how Songkhapa unified oral tradition, so, you know, secret, you know, ear whisper, they have all these kind of things you know, those of you who know about Buddhism know that, and the written literature of the great treatises of the great Indian universities, and he's saying that, that, that there's no rejecting of the oral tradition, I know of the great treatises by oral tradition. If you understand oral tradition as somehow rejecting the great treatises, then you are mistaken. And so oral tradition should finally fit with, great, with the great treatises. That's really remarkable, I think, and marvelous. And he's saying it when he's given oral tradition himself. With regard to oral traditions, you should rely on the authentic ones to serve as keys to help analyze the sutras, tantras, and their commentarial treatise. In other words, don't think that every book in the library is authentic. There may be forged ones, wrong ones, you know, there are the great ones, and then there are lesser ones, you know, he's saying. Here is how to determine if your analysis has reached its culmination. When you have gained conviction on a given point, 
through scripture and reasoning and come to a conclusion. If no qualms remain, even in the deepest recess of your mind, then your analysis is complete. And um, then he just told the work for the welfare of beings, which was really nice. So after that, Sankhava just redoubled his effort in meditating on emptiness and studying it and reading more and more, rereading all the texts. You know, you can reread the same text 20 times, and each time you learn more, and you realize you missed things that were in it before. You know, I always have this experience. It's amazing, actually. So now the next um, thing here is very fun, is where Tsongkhapa is in a monastery called Radon, still in 1397, and uh, Galsapje, uh, who later becomes known as Galsapje, but his name was Dharma Rinchen, uh, who ended up being Tsongkhapa's first successor as the abbot of Ganden, and therefore the head of his new uh, community. Uh, he, uh, he came to see Tsongkhapa, and actually, he was a Sakyapa from Sakyapa Monastery, and he was famous as the greatest debater uh, of all, uh, because Tsongkhapa hadn't been around for 10 years or so by that time, or seven years. Before that, Tsongkhapa was thought to be the greatest when he was there, and they were upset a little bit that he was off by himself, and they wanted, in a way, Gansap was sent to him by the authorities of the tradition to kind of bring him, bring Tsongkhapa back into the fold. He had studied a lot with Rendawa, who was a Sakyapa, and he remained a great student, of, you know, a loyal student of Rendawa's. Um, although Rendawa was a little non-conforming to some of the other Sakyapas, but he was a very, very loyal Sakyapa. But anyway, they were annoyed that Tsongkhapa was, seemed to be having other followers, and he wasn't hard, you know, homing back to Sakyapa all the time. He was studying with lots of other teachers, many Kagyus, Nyingmas, and uh, Kadampas uh, also. So they sent him to do it, and then at first, and there are temp different versions of the story of their meeting, which uh, um, um, uh, Tupte Jima, he recounts, and the first one is not one that I had heard, where Tsongkhapa was expecting him, and he, uh, he had, and he yells up and talked about it, they known each other before as fellow students of Rendawa. And Gyalzap had witnessed Tsongkhapa's remarkable rise in fame and esteem among their monastic peers. When Gyalzap arrived at Radong Monastery, Tsongkhapa led the entire community of monks in formally receiving him by standing in two lines outside the entrance of the monastery. That's a tradition that villages do that with lay people when they want to make an honorable guest welcome, and monasteries do it with great lamas. Having heard so much about Tsongkhapa's fame, Gyatsap was curious to see what Tsongkhapa was like now in person. Once settled, Gyatsap initiated a conversation with Tsongkhapa by asking a series of questions concerning various aspects of Buddhist philosophy and practice. The conversation touched on what are called the Four Reliances, an important hermeneutic principle in Buddhist thought. Rely not on the person, but on the teaching. Rely not on the words, but on the meaning. Rely not on the provisional meaning, uh, rather the, the interpretable meaning, but on the definitive meaning. And rely not on intellectual understanding only, but on experiential understanding through wisdom. And so this, this was a famous set of things of what, you know, when you're learning, how you should, how you should evaluate in, hi in a hierarchy your sources. Um, and it's important when you wisdom being at the top of that hierarchy, the wisdom has to do with being a product of reason. Even though they say you can wrongly understand that as thinking that intellectual understanding is useless from the start, but it doesn't mean that. You get the, the intellectual understanding from the, from the teaching, the meaning, and the definitive meaning, and then you, and then you deepen that with experience, and you gain wisdom. So, so that's the point, you know. Um, so then, then they do, by that, at the end of that, then Gyaltsap felt Tsongkhapa, the way Tsongkhapa explained it, he, did, he pronounced himself to be Tsongkhapa's disciple for life, and <clears throat> bowed to him and all that. But the more fun one that I like was where uh, Tsongkhapa, where, where uh, Gyaltsap 
uh, was initially motivated to meet Tsongkhapa, Kappa, to engage him in debate, sort of on behalf of the second part, he was going to sort of get him back to school. You know. When Gyal Tsongkhapa arrived, Tsongkhapa Kappa was in the middle of a lecture, showing his intention to challenge Tsongkhapa to a debate. Gyal Tsongkhapa sat in the congregation but kept his hat on. Seeing him, Tsongkhapa continued to teach, but got down from the throne and sat on the floor, teaching and sort of sitting at the same level with his students. And then Gyaltsap himself got up, keeping his hat on, and sat on Tsongkhapa's throne, where the teacher's throne, where Tsongkhapa had been teaching. Uh, as then, however, Tsongkhapa continued to teach from the floor, even though Gyaltsap was sitting above him. And, um, uh, as he continued to listen to Tsongkhapa's teaching, however, his demeanor slowly changed. First he took off his hat, then he got down from the throne, and finally he sat down together on a level with Tsongkhapa and his other students to listen to the great teaching that Tsongkhapa was giving. I really prefer that one. I think that's a lot of fun, that one. Because uh, he was a great, great scholar, you know. But whatever the case, it turns out, he's, he's not much younger than Tsongkhapa, but he lives longer than Tsongkhapa, and he and he takes over the he's he's given the the robe and the hat and the whole thing by Tsongkhapa when Tsongkhapa passes away. So then this is the thing. Then then Jimba has from 162 on a very good thing, but I don't think I'll read it. Uh, I'll summarize it about the prevailing views of emptiness, or what I want to call freedom, voidness, ultimate reality uh, in Tsongkhapa's time. And one of them was, the, the most popular one in Tsongkhapa's circles, was from a, actually a great uh, Madhyamaka or centrist, dialectical centrist, um, you know, Prasangika Madhyamaka, people say, and say, when they keep the Sanskrit word, I call dialecticist centrist. And uh, that was that when you sort of, your mind is sort of open, and you're not holding rigidly any view, uh, that is the sort of no position of our own theory of the uh, dialectical centrist. And so it's kind of almost agnostic, like you just open your mind completely and you're not clinging to a particular piece of knowledge of any kind. And that's the view of emptiness. And um, uh, uh, Manjushri criticized Tsongkhapa for that earlier, but that was still the prevalent view at Tsongkhapa's time. And there was a second thing, uh, and that is that uh, a second deeper, worse, worse version of that, which was complete, almost Kantian, that ultimate reality is unknown. And it's just simply you have inference about it, you can't possibly experience or know it. And you can therefore never verify your inference because it's not knowable. And so that, uh, that's, a, that's a second one. Uh, which is like Kant's idea that you can never find the thing on Zik in a, in a thing. You know, assuming it, it, there is such a thing in a thing, you know, which Kant had a different idea than emptiness in that way. So, so then, and there was a third one, which is on the other extreme, that's kind of, and those two are kind of nihilistic, you could say. Grossly and subtly nihilistic. And then there's a third one, which is that emptiness means that the absolute, which is emptiness, is empty of the relative. And, but the absolute is not empty of itself. So that's called other emptiness. Uh, you know, it's emptiness of the, or extrinsic emptiness. So emptiness is just emptiness of all relationality. And emptiness itself is the real thing, the real deal. And it's beyond relationality. Uh, but it's not empty, because it's really there, and therefore it's really there. <laughs> wherever there is. And that's called the Shentong, and that's from the Jonang school, particularly popularized by a guy called Dolpapa, who lived in the previous generation of Tsongkhapa, and um, passed away when Tsongkhapa was four years old, so he never argued directly with him. So uh, that one is, uh, is uh, rejected. And then there are those who, who like the um, dogmaticist centrists, like Baba Viveka and Shantarakshita, who were, and I remember Shantarakshita was the founder of the old school, before there were the multiple schools in Tibet, during the time of the king, ancient kings, 7th, 8th century. 
and they followed the Ofo Shantarakshi does, Svatantrika Madhyamaka, or dogmaticist centers, who were into a certain kind of formal logic in a certain rigid way for, as far as Zongama was concerned. So those were the three kind of views that were there. And Zongama was not satisfied with any of them. And so, and Mangashri just keeps urging, he says, you can't ask me about it, just go and purify yourself. So he went back to his retreat place in the Oka Valley, and then he went way up at a high cave called Vladin uh, to, to the Jiva said, but I was there, and there, the cave is actually called Yama's Tongue Cave, because there's a big flat boulder that forms the roof of the cave that looks like a tongue. And Yama, of course, is a special protector of Tsongkhapa, the god of death, like he, like he is in the Upanishads. You know, Yama is a big deal in the Upanishads in ancient India, even. You know. So it's very interesting. There's a death, you know, death and life, you know, that's when things are real, and death and life, and emptiness and relativity, that's when things are real. So he's there, and Tsongkhapa is studying, and he's reading the 18th chapter of Nagarjuna's 27 critiques. 18th critique, which is critique of the self, and he's reading Buddhapalita's commentary on that. Buddhapalita was a great Indian master of the 6th century, and he's reading his commentary. And um, I had a tick bite here, but I got it right away when it first bit. It's itching now, though. So, um, two days ago. So, um, uh, he's just reading that, and Jimbala doesn't say what um, I was told by oral tradition. That Tsongkhapa was reading the verse that says, the self is not the aggregates, nor is it something other than the aggregates. It didn't say either of those things. And uh, so, uh, at that moment, you know, his finger was on the, was going on the page, and, and everything changed in the universe for him. He left his finger, let's say, he left his body, but was still in his body, but he expanded beyond the boundary, he embraced the pain, and just for him, and, he, and that happened to him on the morning after a dream, where he went to the Trushita heaven, I may have mentioned this before, but it bears mentioning again, it's such a neat story, and in Trushita at the Dharma center there, but in front of, uh, run by the Buddha's Maitreya, the future Buddha Maitreya, Bodhisattva Maitreya, uh, he saw Nagarjuna and Buddha Palita Chandrakirti, all the great dogmaticist masters, having a discussion. And he was at a distance from them, and he didn't get to go up and join them in the dream. He was just in awe watching them discuss. And he wanted to join them. He was flipping out of like, delight. And then one of them got up, a, low, a big, tall one, very dark skinned, that he somehow recognized as Buddha Palita from South India. Uh, who came over carrying a book, which he presumed was the commentary, and touched him on the head, and he felt bliss and woke up. And that's when he then had this thing with his finger on the, on the page, you know. And then he was so amazed by the whole thing, and feeling so grateful and relieved, finally, you know, kind of achieving non-dual communion or something, you know. I think he'd been working with the Guru Samaja personally, the Medjuma doesn't mention it, but he'd been working with tantric things in such a way that he was in a very bad stages of that as well, I think. So he was really having a big enlightenment there, in fact. You know, the dream, because he was traveling in his subtle body, it was like the dream, you know. But anyway, uh, he had no more doubt, and he was very, very clear. And he came up with this um, thing, and then, then uh, Nagarjuna's famous verse uh, in... Um, Chapter 24, to, to who emptiness is functional, everything is functional. For one where emptiness is not functional, nothing is functional. Or you can say possible. When emptiness is possible, everything is possible. When emptiness is impossible, everything is impossible. In other words, what emptiness is, is not some obscure thing that you can't know, and also emptiness is not some other thing that is outside of relativity. Emptiness is relativity. You know, emptiness is form, and form is emptiness. Form is just an example, a visible thing, form means there, or actually form means a material thing, 
And for emptiness is matter, or freedom is matter, matter is freedom. That means that emptiness is a material, it is relativity. That's Tsongkhapa's big breakthrough. It's the discovery, it's the rediscovery. He doesn't consider it beyond Mahajuna, Chandrakirti, many, many great predecessors, and certainly not beyond Buddha. <clears throat> but he is the one who rediscovers it and brings Tibetan Buddhism in a way, except for maybe individual cases, sort of back up to that level. And this really is the root of his greatness and how everything else springs from that. It's like I was reading today, I'm editing uh, my Guya Samadhi, um, the commentary that I and a sort of team of translators translated, and I'm doing the copy, final copy editing absorption, you could call it, of that. And uh, uh, I'm running into uh, uh, all sorts of amazing things about about how you are seeing emptiness when you see a material object, because it is there, because each one of them is empty of anything disconnected from anything else, any absolute essence, yourself and it. And therefore, by the fact that you see it, it's empty. And uh, you're, so you're seeing emptiness when you see the iPhone over there, or when you see my face in the broadcast, then you're seeing emptiness. Because emptiness is not separate. You don't have to dissolve these things to go into space, have a space out experience in order to uh, do that. However, that doesn't mean that the, the space out experience, in case you've had such an experience in meditation or something, is useless. It is useful. Because, uh, and, and maybe that's part of the reason why emptiness or freedom or voidness, it, it would have chose that word to, to describe relativity. Because our habit is to may think of something as a, over there really a thing in itself and, and to feel that we ourselves are really a person in itself, a thing in itself. And that we're, those separations are really, are really the, the absolute thing. And then, and, and so we have, and then we have a binary thing in our mind of something that is non-relative. And so we think that should be also an absolute thing. And so when we, when we look for that, or when we look and see through the relative things that don't find anything non-relative, we will have an experience of the, of their disappearing and ourselves disappearing. But, and then that's all too dangerous to be that reason why I told us achievement of this with the help of Manjushri and all of Rendawa and all his other teachers was so important because it is a little difficult because you, you, you're expecting to see something separate. That's all, oh, now I saw emptiness, you know. You, you can say as if it were a separate thing. You're not expecting to see it non-dually in the act of seeing the iPhone, in the act of seeing the screen, in the act of seeing the, the face of the person projected in the screen. You're seeing emptiness and seeing all of those things, and you're knowing emptiness in knowing all of those things, when you know them awakened, when you lucidly know them, you know them and know that you're knowing them, let's say. So lucidly knowing them means you know them non-dually as emptiness at the same time as you can deal with their specific seeming separateness, illusory separateness. If I didn't lose you, but never mind, we'll come back around. If I didn't lose myself, I might have. So when emptiness works with something, it works with everything. When emptiness doesn't work, it doesn't work with something, it doesn't work with anything. You follow? So this emptiness makes everything possible to work with each other, is what it is. And then talk about later, in speaking of the impact of this experience, talk about would tell his attendants the following, these days with greater familiarity, with insight into emptiness, even in the post-meditation periods. I would have the perception of this entire world of diversity as being empty, yet simultaneously in an illusion-like manner maintaining its specific forms, and the perception of things as not sealed or marked by awareness of their emptiness, as objective facts with intrinsic reality, rarely arises in me now. In other words, he always sees them as sealed with his awareness of their emptiness. 
And then if you put, the, he's putting this in very philosophical terms, but that's why I say this has to be Tantra, you see. Because the word sealed, when he puts sealed in there, that gives it away, you see. That's the great seal, what's called great seal. And the great seal means that the, that the awareness of it is a bliss awareness. It's the bliss of melting while maintaining connection. You know, I'm seeing the other thing as, a, as one seems to be, in its illusory way, but it, it and you melting the whole time. That's why it's illusory. Because you, it's, it, you know, you're, it seems not to be illusory, but you, you know it is illusory. And then that knowing of it makes you feel con contact with freedom, and that contact and release in freedom makes you blissful. And therefore that bliss then, it, text, it, you know, it touches everything. And uh, it touches everything through being indivisible from the reality of everything, which is its emptiness. And that's nirvana and so on. That's really great. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, and the perception of things as if not sealed or marked by awareness of their emptiness, as if they were objective facts with their own separate intrinsic realities, rarely arises in me now, he says. That's uh, really cool. great. I really like that. Okay, so so that's about his emptiness thing, and um, uh, and Zongaba says the statement that the end of origination becomes the meaning of emptiness. Or he uses it, what I use relativity. Jimbala always says dependent origination, but uh, that means interdependent, illusory, you know. Relativistic, you could say. For the Madhyamaka who has negated the centrist, who has negated intrinsic existence by means of valid cognition, it is not just for everyone, for just anyone. This is because when such a centrist person has retains external and internal things as relativities, through the force of that very cognition itself, he or she will realize that things are devoid of intrinsic existence. And even Zosangaba so says he very rarely did, but that was kindness to his students. Even if you did perceive it wrongly, as if not sealed by that, but the fact that you could make a mistake is itself sealed by happiness, because that means you're a relative being. Ha ha ha. And here he quotes from the three principles of the path, which is very, very famous. And he says, when with respect to all things in the world and in nirvana, or in the world and in the, in the transcendent, you see that cause and effect never transgress their laws or they are inexorable. And when you have dismantled the focus of objectification, uh, uh, at that point, you have entered the path that pleases the Buddha. As long as the two understandings of apparent things, the world of relativity and of emptiness, the absence of all points, uh, you know, separate standpoints, as long as those two remain separate, you have not realized the Buddha's intention. The instant you see that, that relativity is undeceiving, if the entire object of grasping and certitude is dismantled, at that point your analysis of the view is complete. Well, well, you could also say if your certitude, if your certitude dismantles your objectifying grasping, you know, you could put certitude on either side of that line. At that point, your analysis of view is complete. Furthermore, when relativity dispels the extreme of existence, and when freedom dispels the extreme of non-existence, and you understand how freedom arises as cause and effect, you will never be captured by extremist views. You know, I'm, 
I'm remembering the Tibetan because this particular verse is so amazing, actually, and good for Jim to quote it, although he and I translated slightly differently. <laughs> he also translated differently in this book, and I think better than he translated it in some other places previously. So everyone improves, you know, it's really great. Really nice. So, so then he uh, spent the entire spring and summer, he, and he doesn't mention he immediately wrote also the great poem called The Essence of Good Eloquence or True Eloquence, and then he quotes that hymn. And he says, um, Whatever degenerations there are, whatever troubles there are in the world, the root of them all is ignorance. You taught, this is Buddha, he's praised for Buddha for teaching relativity. And talk about it soon. You taught relativity, the seeing of which will undo the ignorance. So how can an intelligent person not comprehend that this path of relativity is the essential point of your teaching? This being so, who will find, O oh Savior, a more wonderful way to praise you than to praise you for having taught this relativistic origination. Wondrous teacher, wondrous refuge, wondrous speaker, wondrous savior. I pay homage to you, the teacher who taught well relativistic origination. And then he says, all of this is devoid of essence and from this arises that effect, you know, quote, all of this is devoid of essence, unquote, and quote, from this arises that effect, end quote, these two certainties complement each other with no conflict at all. Instead of far from that they're lacking essence, causality shouldn't work, it is because cause and effect lack essence that they can affect each other, because they're purely interrelated. And without any unrelated essence, each of them, you follow? It's very easy, actually. What is more amazing than this? What is more marvelous than this? If one praises you in this manner, this is a real praise, otherwise not. In other words, this is the key thing, you know? And then he, uh, he goes on, Alas, my mind was defeated by ignorance, although I have sought refuge for a long time. In such an embodiment of excellence, I possess none fraction, fraction of your qualities. He's talking to Shakyamuni Buddha. Nonetheless, that I have found some faith in you before the stream of this life flowing toward death has come to cease. Even this, I think, is fortunate. Among teachers, the teacher of dependent origination or dependent of teacher of relativity, among wisdoms and knowledge of relativity, you who are most excellent, like the kings of the world, know this perfectly well, and no one else. He's saying to Buddha. That's really great. So then um, he talks about other things. Now I think um, I'm going to go on into um, talking about uh, his social activities from this time forward. Um, you know, the danger is that you think, oh, he's a holy saint now, he knows everything, he's enlightened. Why would he uh, do anything? Just sit around and have people worship him or something like that. That's what you might think, <laughs> with the wrong idea. And then see, this, see, some people did resist talking about it, and some people still do today. They still freak out about it. Because, uh, they have this idea, in one way or another, if you notice those two extremes, the kind of nihilistic one, as like there is no such thing as ultimate reality and it's useless to us, so we just sort of resign ourselves to the relative. That's the one type, because we, we're open-minded about it. Well, the other one, which is, the, the absolute is elsewhere and we're going to go there, which is the more prevalent one. That this one, the one that, that one's, the agnostic one is more subtle. And it's not, not there for mass. But the other one is very real and it relates to things like monotheism and any kind of fanatic view where you think there's an absolute that is off planet or off world 
And that, that's where you're going to go and you're going to be saved there because it's out of this world. We have all expressions like out of this world. And as I say, we reify our negative binary concepts, you know, because we have a concept for relative and we have a concept for absolute. And absolute is, uh, doesn't, is not relative. So actually absolute means something you can relate to. And yet we think of it as somehow more valuable, more valid than the relative, because when we relate the relative, it crumbles before our eyes. And we are relative, whatever is relative about us crumbles also as the years pass. So, so naturally we want to think, oh, there's an absolute that won't crumble, that is reliable, that we can really deal with, and we can really be there. And we can escape to and get away from the suffering, right? So that's the more common one. And, and then even you can have an experience like you go into space and everything else seems to fall away and not exist. You know? And then you could be either wrongly thinking, oh, nothing, this is the ultimate reality and that's where I'm going. And that's what all the materials do. Or you can think, well, there's something that I go to that is just like a white space or something, rather than a black space, dark space, you know, pure light or something. And because you can have those experiences. Because our mind is so amazingly created to experience what we think is there. And um, so, at the event horizon, you know, of reality, the mind can produce whatever. So, um, so that's why people resist, because they form a thing, they have an experience, like a space-time experience, and they feel a release in that experience, a relief and a release, a kind of happiness and bliss of sort of samadhi type, at least no pain. And um, and then they come, they, they, that doesn't end. That ends because actually it's not absolute. It's a relative, it has a boundary, you enter and you, end, and you exit. But it seemed like it had no boundary when you were there. So you just think you'll get back there sometime. And then you go around acting high and mighty and you just want people to worship you and stuff like that. Because you know that you're, the world is unreal, and you know really unreal, and there's a really real that is I'm not in the world, and you have your one foot in it, and you're going to go there later, when, maybe when you stop helping them by accepting their worship <laughs> and their donations and what and what have you, all this corrupt cult stuff, and so to discover that that absolute is all of this. What does that put you in? A very different situation. Because then what that means is wisdom becomes compassion. And what that means is your bliss of release becomes a bliss of engagement with those who feel unreleased in the world, which is, and they are absolute. In all their relativity and changeability, it is absolute. So therefore, whatever amount of the absolute you perceive, you want to make it nicer and better and more beautiful and more kind and more happy and any sentient being you want them to be free and happy automatically because you are you are all that it's all the absolute it's clear light it's voidness it's freedom as transparency freedom experience from everywhere within itself freedom you experience from everybody else's point of view not only your own. He doesn't write that one here that I have oral tradition on, where it's all about saying also at that time of that absolute clarity that it was opposite of what he expected. In a way, that's what he said. Of course, it wasn't just not holding anything open mindedly, and it wasn't being in some complete absolute otherworldly place, but it was being totally here as here, being the absolute in its relativity. So like absolute relativity, you could say, which doesn't make any sense, right? So in a way, if you haven't said anything, it's because it's a contradiction, right? Absolute relativity. But you experience, you can experience the, the Buddhahood's experience, like embracing such a cognitive dissonance and such a contradiction uh, uh, happily, blissfully, with the higher energy of bliss. Bliss wisdom.
Okay? And that makes you very compassionate. You know? And people, and, but when people think about it ahead of time, so no one objects to it when they, when they experience it, of course. But when think about it ahead of time, and particularly if they've had an experience seeming of pure freedom apart from worrying about anything, then they resist it because when they think of it as a situation to be in, this unconceptualizable, inconceivable place where you're engaged with everything, absolutely, and then they feel it would be a terrible bunch of work and it couldn't possibly be pleasant and it couldn't be something they could do well and happily. It could not be blissful, in other words. They don't see how you can have a bliss and remain released while engaged. Overcome the release, you know, freedom and bondage. You overcome that. You're bound by compassion to help the others. And you, and you do it with the high blissful energy of freedom. Because there's no duality in it for you. That's so wonderful, actually. It's caking, cake and eating it too. But it seems like too much to digest to certain people, you know, who, whose selfishness has become fixated on a state outside of things that they consider their reality, and they therefore, and it's so satisfied in a way by even having touched that state, and considering they're going to go back there, or as I say, they have one foot in it, they can actually act saintly and unselfish in general in the world, although they will tend to act not so unselfish, actually. Because in a way they think it doesn't matter. Because the world, you know, doesn't matter the condition of everything. Because they think everybody else really doesn't exist, and they don't really exist. So they're in a kind of psychotic state, actually. They may think they're enlightened, and they're in the demon ghost case of the psychosis of not being where they are. Far from being lucidly where they are, they're actually not where they are. And they don't like to talk about that for I know it's it's a way of putting it, you know, the true non-duality. They kind of frighten them. Okay, so, so, what did he do? Well, somehow I had all gotten that wrong until I read his book, actually. Thank you again, Chuk I love it so much, but I can't help criticizing a few things. <laughs> it's terrible. But don't let that rile you from it, that I think it is so great. And I didn't know, for example, that his refurbishing of the Maitreya statue, the beautiful golden copper, sandalwood, crystal, Maitreya, in the Zingji monster where I have been there, well, I've been to some remnant of it, probably, because there must have read probably a lot of it, and there wasn't any such, there was a Maitreya statue, but it wasn't that statue. And uh, it talked, but it was run down, and he did that during his long retreat, in the early years of that long retreat. He didn't do it at the end of it. I thought he did, he did that first, what we call, it's, you know, in the biographies they call it the four great deeds of Zonkap. And the first is that refurbishing of that Maitreya temple and the, the dedication of it, which, which, and I think that it is his first because it indicates the progressiveness of Zonkap's movement. Because, you know, movements that are schools, movements, orders, whatever you want to call them, that are associated with the future Buddha tend to be progressive because they see the future as positive. Ones that are associated with the past Buddha only tend to get, can easily deteriorate into something conservative, by thinking of things as degenerated, it's where you just want to keep whatever old thing there was. So, so they're not, they're not progressive. They are very conservative. So, so therefore his contact with Maitreya, his visions of Maitreya, even more than the statue, and therefore sealing that by refurbishing that even before his own deepest freedom emptiness experience, it was still considered his first major deed. Because in a way you could say it reoriented Tibet to a positive future at a time in Tibetan cosmology and Buddhist cosmology at the time. After all, India, Buddhism in its home country was destroyed by then. Buddha had predicted four or five hundred year periods that would be still some sort of genuine teaching of his. And then the last 500, up to 2000 to 2500, as being a fake teaching, fake Dharma, more or less, fake Buddhism. 
So they're thinking things are really over going down in Kali Yuga. And at that time, by looking to future Buddha, in the steps, following the steps of the great Asanga, you know, thousands of years before, 1500 years before in India, he, uh, uh, or 1200 years before in India, he, he, uh, he renewed things and made it progressive. So that's the first deed, is that the refurbishing of that, event, that uh, consecration. And in the process of that consecration, he, people all over Tibet have these visionary experiences in the sky. And it sort of was served notice, you could say, that something new is going to be happening now in Tibet, uh, according to the reports, which uh, materialist scholars will discount as hagiographic, but I will credit as, as very possible from these extraordinary beings who are supernormal. They're not supernatural, but they're supernormal. Okay, so that's the first one. Then the second one, Next one, he went to uh, his patrons, the Chenga Rinpoches, of the Bhagmo Dhruva Kagyu school, and um, who were the most dominant uh, political force in Tibet at that time. And um, he requested the Lamas in the movement to call a congress of all of the orders and and uh, renew the Vinaya, the rule, the monastic discipline or rule. Um, and also it includes uh, the ethics of the laity, the ordained the laity who are Upasikas and Upasikis, you know, uh, who are nearby with the monastics, that means, you know, and who are sort of a little bit self-restrained, but they're lay people, you know, and they have families and they work and they also support the monastics. So there's a fourfold community. So he created this congress one summer, I think 1401, uh, Ajipa will say, you know, at um, Namze Deng, I think. <clears throat> or, um, you know, Tutela, like me, he's an ex monk. So, uh, he, uh, he doesn't give it its own chapter. But anyway, what he did is, he, um, he uh, called this great congress, and by looking back at the rule, he stopped beer drinking or alcohol use in some of the monasteries, and, and monks being married, and all this sort of thing, you know, and all kind of laxity in the rules, and monks doing business too much, although the Treasurers of the monasteries did have to manage the resources of the, because the institutions were so huge. But mainly he got them out of business and things. So he renewed the monastic base. And this, and, and this is especially significant and extraordinary if you think, as I do, although, and Jimala more traditionally doesn't emphasize that. But the, that the 1398 enlightenment involved his realizing the certain stages of Tantra, as well as the correct and final insight into centrist freedom, you know, philosophical, in other words, you know, soteriological or, you know, practice-wise in Tantra, as well as philosophy and science-wise in, uh, in uh, Sutra, you know. So both in science and in art, he attained it at the same time. So he was a big fan already, that means, of Tantra. You know, he was doing Kala Chakra there before that final experience and making and, then, and yet working on him. So he worked on them integrated really from youth, you know, as is, as is the best way to do it, actually. And, um, um, but nevertheless, the first step he takes once he starts really getting lots of followers is monastic order. And then one would say, well, why not? Why would I never just become a tantric yogi? And the reason is, that not everyone is capable of becoming a tantric yogi. And if they misunderstood a lot of things in the tantric teachings, they would become very unruly types of lay people, even. Not, not only not good monks, but they become like wild people, really. You know, hedonistic and crazy, you know, probably. And so, the, the, in order to get an education, you know, you can't do this tantra until you have at a certain level of education about your own psyche and about the world and about the science of, and biology. And, you know, you have to have deep insight about yourself and, and, and 
very intense compassion cultivated there by that such insight, and some level, at least a very full-scale inferential understanding of emptiness, and maybe some basic superficial experiences, or not superficial, but basic, you know, partial experiences, let's call them, deep, but maybe, but partial still experiences of freedom or emptiness. So those are the prerequisites, and you have to have a certain level of self-restraint and the ability to self-detach, so that you're, because remember in Tantra you're using passion, hate, delusion, jealousy, pride, you know, the, the, the deadly sins, you know, the poisons, the mental poisons. You're using them, and to be able to use those poisons, you have to have initially had a certain vision of, and an understanding of how to separate yourself from them and not be driven impulsively by lust or hate or jealousy or whatever, you know. You can sort of relate to them in a more free way. You maybe haven't undone the unconscious grounds of them yet, but you, but you, but you have gotten rid of being pushed too impulsively and too easily and too readily by their manifestation in your conscious mind, if you follow me. And then it's safe for you to do Tantra, right? So therefore, precisely because he loved Tantra, he realized it was human beings chance at a moon shot, you know, or a sun shot, or an outer, you know, like Mars, whatever, Venus, you know, the, 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 the moon of, uh, the moon of Jupiter, where the Avatar lives, you know, whatever his name is, some fabulous world, and um, uh, you, a human being has that shot, and being, uh, making all the world, seeing, even better than seeing all the worlds, that's fabulous. It's the greatest thing a human being can do, evolutionary-wise, right? Evolutionarily. And so, because he did that, he wanted his Tibetan people to be educated. And the, and the education system was the monastic education system at that time. And because actually that was the cheapest, and had the most beneficial side effect of getting the males out of their war battalions, out of their banners, as they call them, you know, their war, their war uh, troops, getting them out of the army, army. This had been a conquering country, remember? And there were still people fighting here and there in Zonkaba's day, amongst themselves, you know. Uh, they had had a period of peace when the control by their own central dynasty won, but that was at the price of conquering others outside. Then without doing that in the second round, they had a period of peace under the Mongolian uh, uh, sovereignty, suzerainty, you could say, and keeping them from fighting with each other. But then in this period, there was a certain amount of inner conflicts, and not religious, but uh, you know, over property and over ego of, of the local dukes and barons and people like that, as usual, you know, in human societies. So, um, so the Vinaya, you know, and this, this is where for years Zonkapa was known as a kind of Martin Luther figure, although that doesn't really make sense because he was reforming a monastic order. So it was um, um, uh, seen, but seen as a sort of prudish kind of, you know, scholastic prudish, monas monkish kind of person because of this first great deed, reforming the Vinaya. But this reforming of the Vinaya is what turned Tibet into the educational culture that it became, where instead of an army, its major institution other than the government was the monastic network, and which led to having a population of something like six million, maybe in Dongola's day, maybe eight million or so, eight, ten million, but such a population having thousands of monasteries more monasteries than all of Western Europe at the height of Cistercian monasticism, more monasteries by five than all of the Russias of the, when they were do, be, doing Orthodox monasticism. You know, Father Zosima and people like that. Amazing kind of thing. It was, it was like a counter-reformation, if you will, of a sort, a reformation in another direction, you could say. So that's the second great deed. And then the third great deed was also truly remarkable because, and this happened, uh, that, uh, 1401, that, that one was, I think. I didn't find it right away here. I'm sure it's in here, but I didn't find it. And then, then in 1409, so maybe eight years later, he was, of course, teaching like a, like a, 
you know, multi-channel broadcast, you know, people coming from all over, teaching all different kinds of subjects. In the same day or the same week, he would do like two tantric initiations, like a course of logic, a course of ethics, a course in metaphysical science, you know, etc. You know, he was uh, meta-science, if you will. He was really functioning like that, and the, the crowds and the mobs were coming one after another. And therefore, his main patrons, the Bhagavan Dhruva generals and others, uh, the different kings, local barons or kings, they wanted to support him, which he did in the normal great master tradition in Tibet up to his day. Whereas you would make a new monastery of your own, and it would be big, as, big, as big as you were to house all the people studying with you, they'd all come and settle there. And so that's what they wanted him to do. And he did live in a place, Ganden, sort of smallish retreat center, but it was getting overtaxed. He would go back and forth to his old retreat center somewhat. He kept moving around. But his main base was my trip, was a Ganden monster. And um, they, so they, he, he, people had given a lot of offerings for him to build a monster. So instead of building that monastery, starting about two years before his third main event in 1409, he started hiring lots of artists, architects, carpenters, sculptors, etc., to go all over Lhasa and repair and refurbish and renew and polish and add to all the main shrines, the center pilgrimage centers of Tibet, you know, in Lhasa, from dating from a from thousand years previous, uh, or eight hundred years previous. And, um, and then the, he made a grand opening in a two-week festival, which was based on the two weeks of miracles performed by Shakyamuni Buddha in his history, late in his life, where he showed the supremacy of his understanding of reality over various rival teachings. And also he just pleased everyone in the, in the, among the 16 city-states of India of that time. And he delighted all the kings and all the people, huge, huge host of people were collected there. And he did this for two weeks at the Lunar New Year in springtime um, in uh, the city of Shravasti and so on. He, he made this two-week festival. And in that festival, everybody went on retreat. All the lay people closed their shops. They, except for those serving the pilgrims, pilgrims were invited from all schools to come to Lhasa. And the, and the whole city became a temple. And they had prayer rows and ranks of praying monks and things in the streets and in the, all the lay houses, and in the inns, and in the monasteries, of course, and the Jod, centered on the Jod Temple. And so the Munlan Chemo was called the Great Prayer Festival of the Great Miracle Happenings, you know, type of thing. And that would happen the unbroken tradition until the Chinese invaded Tibet. Uh, well, until they cracked down after invading. First they let the Tibetan, pretended that they were let the Tibetans to remain Buddhist, but they, they, they changed that when they got entrenched. So, so anyway, this was the third great deed, the great Malam Chemo. And I think this was a way from a spiritual basis of renewing the 500 years of Tibet's efflorescence, its flowering, its renaissance, in, um, in uh, really taking the human life as an opportunity to really fulfill what a sentient being can become, to become Buddhas, as many as possible in a population which was still not many compared to the millions of people, but, but you know, by some getting li lifting to that state, then the vibe was, the morphic resonance was such that the whole society was lifted into a very optimistic, positive, cheerful, gentle, relatively speaking, not perfect. You know, people are always scared when you talk about Tibet as, as being something special among nations in history. They say, oh, you're making it into Shangri-La, and everyone's perfect and lives forever, and blah, blah, blah. And they stay young forever. And I, no, I don't say that. Of course not. But they can still be better. <laughs> and all the neighboring kingdoms all around have big armies. Once you have a big armies, you are celebrating violence. Once you celebrate violence in the, in the army for preparing for its eventual war, People train like that, go around and behave violently in bars, they behave violently in their families, if they go back to their families, they, then they, they make wars because that's what they're good at. And therefore everybody in those societies are not happy.
So if you had a society that demilitarizes and is open about it, and it, it, Tibet was able to do it, luckily, because it was inaccessible. It was not easy to invade Tibet until it took 500 years from then before it was invaded. India got wasted and invaded. China did too. All sorts of places did, but Tibet didn't. And uh, until the 20th century. So, so therefore, uh, they were happier and uh, gentler and happier. Just like I think many of these nations of the Indian subcontinent until around 11, 1200, before they were conquered from outside, they also became happier. You could see it reflected in their poetry and their arts and their architecture. And, and even in the fact that they got conquered <laughs> when they'd been very fierce themselves. And the Persian emperors had never conquered them in the, you know, 1500 years earlier, nor did Alexander the Great manage. So, but by the time of the Persian and Tajik and other um, conquests, Mughal conquests, they were, India was more peaceful, whether you call themselves Buddhists or Hindus or whatever they were, more gentle. So that was the third great deed, was the Manlam Chapel. And then the fourth great deed, I won't talk about at length, I'll talk about more next class, where I will do a lot more about Tantra. And um, the fourth great deed was not the... Then after, by the way, yeah, just to fill in the story, after the Malin Chemo, which was a blowout bash, for, and the descriptions of it are extraordinary. And also, even though he was giving away all his wealth in free food for two weeks and refurbishing temples and whatever it was, for like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, he, people came and brought more. So he had even more money after that, actually, you know, by giving it all away. And the very significant thing, which is where, what I say that the essence of the Tibetan consciousness happens, what I call millennial consciousness. And that was, he offered to the Zhou statue of Buddha, in the Jokan, the central cathedral of Lhasa, special kind of breast ornament and crown ornament and earrings and jewels and things. And now that Buddha was a monastic Buddha, you know, form, with a monk's robe and so forth, and therefore they don't wear hats and they don't, they don't wear jewels and ornaments. And then, you know, like Gandhi was all freaked out how come the Tibetan Buddhists put crowns on Buddha? He would have left the throne, he wasn't a king. But the point is, in the, in the, in the Mahayana, the, when you become a Buddha, you become a king at the level of the beatific body, the Sambhogakaya. You don't withdraw, you don't cease to exist as a Buddha. You withdraw your coarse body, your Nirmanakaya, in order to teach impermanence, in order to get people to make use of the teaching themselves and not just sit there and stare goofily with devotion at you, but you instead you get them to work on it yourself. So he withdrew from that, but he's still there in this cosmic, you know, subtle plane level, bliss level, uh, beatific level, Sambhogakaya, and of course Dharmakaya. And he's there as an individual in Sambhogakaya, as one with all Buddhas in Dharmakaya. And so by giving the crown ornaments, like royal ornaments, to the monk Buddha, what he's doing is he's saying, you, we are seeing through your representation, because Buddhists all know that the idol is not the thing. The idol is just a memory device. But he says, we are thinking of you as still present, not as having left. And he says that actually in his enlightenment poem about how he, he's still here in the form of the teaching, in the form of his energy helping us realize the teaching. You know, because he's indivisible from us in all time. Buddhas are indivisible from all beings in all places in all times. And so therefore he created, this was a symbol of his triggering through his understanding of the absoluteness of this relativity. The absoluteness of this history, of this, of this illusory, even though it's illusory and magical and never quite what it seems, it still is a process. And because it's absolute as a process, uh, as, as a non-absolute process, then um, uh, there's nothing to do but make it better. And therefore, the beings that know that, which are countless in number as the beings who don't know that, they are shaping every cosmic situation and every history 
for the betterment of all the beings in the history. And they have great powers to do it. They, don't, they didn't create the world, so they can't just, just jump them into their own futures where they're going to be Buddhas. Just bang like that, or start them as Buddhas. They can't do that. But they, they, they can accelerate and they can shape things where they're going to figure it out with optimal effectiveness within an evolutionary causal matrix, if you will. Okay? So that's millennial consciousness. And why do I call it millennial? Well, you know, you have people in the monotheistic religions are waiting for the second coming. Not only Jesus is going to come back and it's going to be a rapture and we're going to have heaven on earth, Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, but also the Muslims are waiting for the Mahdi, I think the Sunni Muslims, the Shiite Muslims are waiting for the, great, the hidden Imam to come out. You know, the, the Jews are waiting for the Messiah to save them, you know. The Hindus are waiting for Kalki, the 10th avatar of Vishnu, to come and get rid of anybody who's mean to them. <laughs> And some of them are nicer than others. And, uh, and the Buddhists are not waiting in Tibet. They weren't waiting. The Buddhists were, you know, Dogapa was saying, the Buddha is here. This is, this is the New Jerusalem. Now act like it. What, what are you going to do in the New Jerusalem if not be Christ yourself? You're going to be perfectly Islamified yourself. You're going to be like a Messiah yourself. You're going to be, save everybody, take responsibility for everybody. You're going to be like a, like a savior of people. What else are you going to do? You know, that's what Jesus said to do, be like me, to turn the other cheek, love everybody. You know, you're not going to go conquering, beating people up and doing all kinds of horrible things. You, you, supposedly that's the whole thing, waiting for the Messiah to come. So that's the time when everything is in fruition. So what talk about saying in 1409 is fruition is here. There's every facility, there's every knowledge. You're the smart human beings with great individuality and great energy and great creativity and great courage. And Shakyamuni Buddha's energy and presence, the clear light, and great Vajradhara's great clear light is here with you now. And so you can do maximum according to the structure of where you, of yourself Embodiment, where you're embodied, whatever you're embodied as. You can do the utmost that you can. And there's a, there's a, so then you have Lam Rim Chemel, it's like a big escalator, and Nag Rim Chemel, the great sages of the, of the uh, exoteric path and the great sages of the esoteric path. Like one giant escalator, evolutionary escalator, something like that. Okay? So, so that's what it is, and, and I think that's what I, where I will stop today with that. And um, I think that's enough for today. And I, of course, I can't ask questions, I can't answer questions. If anybody has a burning question, you could maybe send it in to bobthurman.com somehow. Forward we, slash contact. Or what? bobthurman.com forward slash contact. Well, okay, slash contact. And, um, you know, I don't know, depending how many there are, whether I can answer them or what, what to do, but I'll try, at least you can formulate them. And uh, if I was in line with you, I would spend 20 minutes now doing questions. But um, if you do send some, I will look at them and then maybe answer them next, last session, which is last, next week I will do. And meanwhile, get better, build your immunity, take lots of astragalus. Get astragalus. It's a Chinese herb but you can buy it from Amazon. You don't have to go to the drugstore. And it's a good one. And take turmeric. And that's a good one. And, uh, and get lots of sleep and rest and be loving and happy with the family that you're locked up with. And, um, you know, and, and be online and watch only nice and good shows. And uh, don't watch too much all the nerve wracking stuff. Get your batch of news once a day quickly and then and then be, elevate yourself, okay? Read something, read, read the life of Tsongkhapa. <laughs> or read, if you're new to, newer to Buddhism, read my Inner Revolution book. Or read our Life of uh, Man of Peace, of Life of the, the Illustrated Life of the Dalai Lama. You can get these all on Amazon. Okay? So all the best. Okay, thank you, good night.
This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menlo Retreat and Dewa Spa Membership Community. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House Membership, please visit tibethouse.us. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.